All right, how do you get better at saying no? I mean, I think the first thing that Seneca would point out is that there is a cost to saying yes. He talks about how we're so good at protecting our property. If someone came and stole your watch or your phone, you'd get mad at them. But the fact that your phone and your watch steal time from you, you have no problem with. And time is the one thing you can't get back. You can always buy more stuff. So I think that's number one. Number two is this question that Marcus really said. He said, ask yourself with every action, is this essential? So like, do you really need to do this? Or is it just a social obligation that's being pushed on you? Is it someone else trying to take something from you? Is it someone else trying to get something for free from you? Is it someone else guilting you into doing something that you don't really want to do or does it make you better? And so think about, again, when you're doing those inessential things, that, that comes at the cost of the essential thing. And then know what you actually want your life to look like, like what you want your day to look like. For me, I hate meetings, I hate being on the phone, I like having time sitting there writing, I like spending time with my family, I like ha exercising, running, working out, stuff like that. So I think about what this is taking me away from, and then I'm, it's easier for me to say no, I don't say maybe when all I really want to say is no, um, and then that gives me the freedom to say yes to the things that are important. You know, Seneca wrote this amazing essay, it's called On Anger, and he, he just talks about how like lust or desire or temptation, they're not great things, but they're about pleasure. Anger is about hurting people. Like when you're angry, you want people to suffer. And so anger is this toxic force that it rises up within us for all these reasons, but it does not produce anything good. You know, people make this argument like, oh, anger's a powerful fuel. Yeah, sure, but it also explodes all over people at, you know, uh, at, at a moment's notice. It's very difficult fuel to control, to contain. And so a stoic is wary of anger. They keep their distance from it. And when they feel that sort of passion or intensity or that desire to hurt or harm or get even, um, they, they, they pause. Like you want to give those feelings a, a chance to dissipate. Like when you're, when you're like, I can't believe that person did that. I'm going to call them right now. Nothing good is coming from that conversation. You know, like when you get an email that pisses you off and you type that perfectly crafted response, that's just going to eviscerate that person. That's exactly the kind of thing that you want to hit the delete button on and give yourself 24 hours or 48 hours to think about. Um, doing things out of anger is not only not productive, but it eats at the person who's doing it. You know, like if you're if you're trying to win or be successful because you you're angry at the way people treated you as a child, um, when you get that thing, what you're gonna find is that it not only it didn't prove it, but that it like broke you in the process. And now you're gonna have to find new things to be angry about. It's a treadmill. You just don't get off. And so, anger is something to be very very careful around. Like, look. A lot of great music has been written by people who are fueled by drugs, but also killed a lot of great musicians. And that's, that's how I think about anger. Hey, it's Ryan. I just wanted to thank you for supporting Daily Stoic. If you want to support us more, please subscribe, like our videos, comment, share with your friends. Sign up for our email at dailystoic.com email. You can also check out dailystoic.com store. That's how we keep these videos high quality and ad free. If you want to support us, buy one of our awesome philosophically inspired products. Thank you for all the support. One of the more interesting things about Seneca is he quotes Epicurus over and over and over again. And that's interesting because Epicureanism and Stoicism are supposedly opposite schools. He knows that there's something weird about it because he keeps referencing how weird it is that he would quote Epicurus. But then he says, you should never be afraid to quote a bad author if the line is good, which I think is a great insight. And then later he says you should read from the opposing schools or the opposing religions or from people who think very differently than you as if you're a spy in the enemy's camp. So instead of having this sort of closed-minded view of like, I know how things should be, and so I'm only gonna look around for confirmation of those ideas, he's saying you should look for and borrow from every single person you could possibly learn from. And I think that's great. So like everyone who's following this account who likes stoicism, it's like important that you're not limiting yourself just to that. Read the Bible, read the Quran, read Hebrew thinkers, read from Buddhism, from Confucianism, read from history, read from pop psychology, read from uh, mystical stuff. Like it doesn't matter where it's coming from or even who it's coming from. 
if it's true, like even a hypocrite might be right. Their behavior might be violating what they're saying. And you obviously don't want to emul emulate that. But the, the truth is what's important. And I mean, Seneca is a great example of this. Like he is a brilliant writer and thinker, but m largely fails to live up to his own teachings. And so um, I, I think you still would want to follow and study him. And so don't be afraid to take from and borrow from just about anything. And don't think that Stoicism is this dogma and that anything that deviates or disagrees from it, um, you're not allowed to, to, to take seriously. I think one of the most withering lines from Seneca, he says, you're afraid of dying, but how is the way that you're living any different from being dead? And I think his, his point is that we go around, we have this anxiety about death. We don't want to die. We want to stay alive. But if we actually looked at our life, I mean, you're afraid of, you're afraid of dying because you're going to miss out on all these Netflix shows. Like you're afraid of dying because you're going to you're not going to get to spend all that time in traffic anymore. And Marcus Aurelius, he said something really similar. He said, you're afraid of dying because you can't do this anymore. And it's the same idea. Like we waste so much time. So much of life is absurd and lame and ridiculous. And we're really just like burning the days. We're just like, we're almost like prisoners. We're just watching the, the second hand on the wall just tick away until we are freed by death. And so the idea isn't depressing. It's not saying that life is, is meaningless and that you should kill yourself. It's saying the opposite. It's saying that life is super meaningful and you're an idiot if you waste a single second of it. I mean, that's, that's sort of the idea of the, of the Memento Mori coin that, that we've, we've made and that all these people carry with them now. It's like, look, you will die. It's a fact of existence and you can leave life at any moment. So let's make sure that you make the most of this moment. That's the idea. The other, I think, badass line from Seneca, he says, you act like mortals in all that you fear and immortals in all that you desire. So we go around and we, we, we're afraid of shit. We're afraid of heights. We're afraid of getting hit by a bus. We're afraid of being mugged. We're afraid of dying in an accident. And yet when we think about like all the money that we're trying to earn and all the fame that we want and all the pleasures that we want to have, we, we're acting as if this is going to go on forever and that we need as much of it as humanly possible and that we need to defer the present moment so we can have more in the future. But the truth is we are mortal and that the future is not a given. And so why don't we just find, you know, the Aristotelian mean, some midpoint between the two. Why don't we think about that? Why don't we just think about letting this moment that we're in be enough, not having fear, not having desire, just having sort of gratitude and appreciation and presence for what we have in front of us. I mean, to me, that's the way to do it. Seneca has this quote, I actually have it on my wall in the other room, and he said, Some lack the fickleness to live as they wish and live only as they have begun. And to me, it's like a, it's a great reminder that just because you're stuck in some pattern, just because you've been doing something for a long time, just because you were born a certain way or born in a certain place, that doesn't mean you have to keep doing it. Life is short. It's your life. You should do what you want to do with it and you should live well. Just because you've, uh, you've made mistakes in the past, just because you're, you, you haven't fulfilled your potential in the past, that doesn't mean that you can't change, that you can't uh, get onto the path that you wanna get. And I don't think people should be afraid to, to change. Fickleness seems like a bad word, but if, if, you're, if you're being fickle to get into the right place, into where you should be, then I think that's a virtue. Thanks for watching. Please click subscribe below for more content from us at Daily Stoic.